that good? Good evening. Um, before I get started, there's something that I want to do. This is a, this is a very unique experience for me. Um, this is where I was brought up as a, as a child, and there are Bible school teachers here right now that taught me as a child. I learned my first memory verses from these ladies. So this is kind of a full circle thing for me, and it's uh, it really is an honor to be able to stand up here and speak to you tonight. I'm grateful for the opportunity. There's three other people that uh, I have never spoken in front of. Um, my mother, my father, and my sister are all here, and I have, they have never heard me speak publicly. Privately, they've heard me speak to excess, but never publicly. Well, that's not entirely true. There was the spelling bee in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, when Dad was at East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions. That was the only time that they ever actually heard me get up in front of anybody and speak. Just so you know, it is decathlon, not decathlon. Because if you spell it decathlon, you get to go home. Um, we're going to talk a little bit tonight. When I found out what my topic was, it was very interesting to me because it, there's no way to really kind of pigeonhole uh, A, B, C, and D with turning the page on sin. Um, so we're going to kind of wander around in a few different directions, and then we're going to come back together with an explanation of turning the page on sin. I do not have uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not very tech savvy. Um, but Paul had someone write his letters for him because of an, infl of an affliction. I have an affliction. I have techitis. So we're going to be turning pages tonight. So I hope you have your Bibles with you. I love to hear the pages turn. I heard my grandfather say that many times from the pulpit. There's no sound like hearing the pages turning. We're going to start out talking about the effect that sin has on our lives. What is sin? What does it? How does it affect us? Um, from that point, we're going to talk about grace and the effect that it has on our lives. We're going to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. We're going to talk about four very specific things that I think will lead you to bear those fruits of the Spirit. We're going to talk about our role as Christians. What is our role as a Christian? Uh, we're going to talk about letting our light shine. So get your Bibles ready, and let's start turning the page on sin. How does sin affect me? I looked up the definition. Webster's definition of sin is an offense against God. A vitiated, and I looked that up too because I didn't know what that meant. Um, vitiated means a defective state. A vitiated state in which one finds themselves estranged from God. Um, I believe Brother John Burnett talked about this uh, in um, Vacation Bible School last Wednesday night. In Genesis 3... Starting in verse 8, it talks about God was walking in the garden. He was walking in the garden with man. And they hid themselves because they were ashamed. And God found them. And he said, why are you hiding? And they said, because they were ashamed. And he realized that they had eaten from the tree um, of knowledge, good and evil. And that was something that he had told them not to do. They had sinned. And that sin got them cast out of the garden. So there you see the separation from the first man. Um, turn to Romans chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 12. 
Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. For sin indeed was the world, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. So we see that sin brought death into the world, that separation from God. Because before sin, there was no death. God lived with man, was going to live with man in the garden, and we messed that up. So, turn to Isaiah 59. Starting in verse 2. But your iniquities, excuse me, starting in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. I love the English language, and I love the way that this, this verse is, because basically what this verse is saying is, God's hand can save you. They use a double negative there to say God's hand can save you. And his ear can hear you. And then the most powerful word in the English language. But your sins have made it to where he can't do either one of those. Um, So sin is a very powerful thing. I think we brush it over sometimes. I I don't, I mean, I I know we don't just completely dismiss it. But I think we, you know, we kind of talk about it like, well, yes, we all sin. But what we don't realize is that God can't be any part of that. God has, will have nothing to do with sin. It completely separates us from him. Remember the scene on the cross? In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, L-O-I, L-O-I, Lama Sabachthani, which translated is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he say that? Because he was made sin. Second Corinthians 5.21. Turn there. Keep your finger there, because we're going to come back to that verse. For our sake, he was made sin. So Jesus, God couldn't even, Jesus wasn't even immune to the separation that sin causes between us and God. Even he felt it. In his most trying hour, because he was made sin for us, God had to hide his face from him. It's a very serious issue, isn't it? Keep one thing in mind while I'm talking up here. If I ask a question, I know this is a lecture series, but if I ask a question, it's not recorded. Feel free to answer. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, and verse 23, says, the wages or the just reward, the recompense. I mean, we all have jobs, or some of us have jobs. Some of us are lucky enough to be retired. Our wage is something that we expect. We're grateful to have a job, but we don't go to the boss and say thank you every time they have us, they hand us a check because that's the reward for what we've done. I think that's why that's such a good word here, the wages of sin. It's death. There's no way around that. We serve a just God. He's a God of love, but he's also a just God. You wouldn't want to serve anything other than a just God, would you? And because he's a just God, 
death had to happen. That, that debt had to be paid. Christ paid it for us. So what now? What do we, where, do we, where do we go from there? Do we, like Daniel said in, uh, on Sunday night, do we try real hard and make an honest effort? What, what can you and I, in and of ourselves, what can we do about the problem of sin? Nothing. There's nothing that we can do. That's why... Christ had to be made the propitiation for our sin. I looked that word up too. There's a lot of words in here that I don't know. Um, I've heard it many times, and I had a pretty good idea of what it meant, but I wanted to look it up. Some of the synonyms for propitiate. Appease, placate, pacify, satisfy. The only thing that could satisfy God's need for some recompense when it came to sin was Christ. In John, in John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the word was. Skip down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We all know John 3.16. God loved us enough uh, that, that he sent his only Son to be that propitiation, that satisfaction for sin that had come into the world. Turn to Ephesians 2. Starting in verse 4, but, but, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By, Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness, in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that anyone may boast. So grace is what saves us. How do we get in that grace? Okay. Faith is what? Belief? That's a little bit more than that. We come in contact with that grace in Christ. It says right here. In Christ. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, the verse we just read. Look at the last part of that verse. I was in 2 Corinthians and not 1 Corinthians. For our sake he was made to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in who? In Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So we have to be in Christ to contact that grace. 
how do we get in Christ? Those of us, those of us that are here that are already Christians, we, we know the plan of salvation. You've got to hear the word. You've got to believe. Confess. Repent, confess, and then you're saved. Oh, and then you're baptized, immersed in water for the remission of your sins. So faith, Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Okay, so we have to have faith. Repentance, Acts 3.19, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you. Um, any other verses? 2 Corinthians 7.10. Um, confession. Romans 10.10. 10. For the heart one believes and is justified. For the mouth confession is made unto salvation, toward salvation. Um, and then we must be baptized. Acts 2.38. Matthew 28.19 and 20. Mark 16.16. 16. Um, all of those verses. That That is how we get... In Christ. Okay? Turn to Galatians 3 with me, if you would. Turn the pages there. If we're going to turn the page on sin, we might as well turn the pages, right? What did I say? Galatians 3. Verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So the steps that we've talked about, including with immersion in water for the remission of our sins, is how we put on Christ. We have to die to sin. Death through repentance, we are dying to the sin that has enslaved us. Okay? And then we're buried, symbolically buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. We rise up and walk a new life. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I always want to sing that because there was a song at Freed Hardman that we sang it devotional every time. And I want to sing that verse every time I, every time I quote it. All right, so we died, a, we died a sin. We're buried with Christ. We're crucified. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And that's it. Baptized, put on Christ, sin goes away, and never have to confront it again. Nope. That's a good thing, because I've got a lot more notes here. So, um, If that were true, there's a lot of passages in the New Testament that don't make any sense to me. Let's take a look at some of those. Peter, writing in his epistle to the churches of the dispersion. Um, in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says to be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, or as the ESV says, seeking someone to devour. He's looking to devour somebody. Well, if, if once we were baptized, we didn't have to worry about sin anymore, then that wouldn't be true. We have to constantly be wary because he's walking around trying to find somebody to devour. Turn to John 15. I 
And I've had discussions with people before, as we all have as Christians. We've had people that have talked to us and told us that, that you know, once you're baptized and saved, you're always saved. Um, I think there's entirely too many scriptures in the New Testament that bear out that that's not the fact. That's not the case. John 15, starting in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be to my so prove to be to my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So obviously. There's more to it than just being baptized for the remission of your sin. Um, we've got to carry on past that. We are, remember, there's two parts to baptism. There's the burial, and then resurrection. Just as Jesus rose from the dead different, we have to rise from the dead different. We have to die to our sin and rise different than we were before. We're no longer a slave to it. To what? To walk in newness of life. We are a new creature. We've risen from that grave, that watery grave, a new creature. And we have to walk that way. So we are saved by grace. But it's through faith. The Bible bears that out. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. But there are there is things that we have to do. There are things that we have to do. There's some English again. <laughs> there are things that we have to do. Um, we have to walk a new life. We have to bear fruit. Jesus tells us that if we don't bear fruit, we're going to be cut off and cast into the fire. So it's, it's not just, it's, the end is not at baptism. It's just the beginning of this walk. So faith, true faith, is in your actions. Um, turn to James 2.17. James speaks real specifically about that. He says, faith without works is what? Dead. The way I interpret that, faith without works is not really even faith. It's not just dead, it's just, it's not faith. Faith without works is belief. If you look down in verse 19, he says, even the demons believe. You're not doing anything by believing. Your faith has to lead you to do something. Look at Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter. By faith, Abel, what? He offered a more perfect sacrifice. By faith, Noah, he built an ark. By faith, Abraham. What if Abraham had said, God... I know, I know what you're saying is it's just and it's true. I just don't really feel like packing up and moving. Well, he wouldn't be in this chapter. We know that. He would not be in the great faith chapter because he didn't. His faith didn't lead him to. His belief did not lead him to anything. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is not really faith. So we must walk in the light. 
1 John 1, 6 and 7, if we say we have fellowship or we walk in darkness, we lie. We do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. Okay? That's the grace part. There has to be action, grace through faith. Through our faith, we, we believe, we confess, we repent, we're baptized into Christ, and we walk in the light. And if we do that, his grace continue to cleanse us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I can mess up. And I do. We all do. Romans 6.23 says, all have sinned. All sin. But the grace of God is my protection. If I continue to walk in the light, it's going to cover me as long as I'm walking in that light. Turn to Galatians 5 and go ahead and put your little marker there. Because we're going to come back to that. Paul says it a little bit differently. He doesn't say walk in the light. Paul talks about staying in step with the Spirit. They're waiting on me. We're going to start in verse 17. For the for, excuse me. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Stop there for a second. The whole, the whole book of Galatians was written to the church at Galatia, and they were having a problem because they had all gotten into Christ. Now they wanted to go back and bind the law. And Paul was really upset. He said, you know, you, you have a law here that's got... 613, I think, at some point, so people say that there's at least 613 commandments that you can't keep. It was, it was, it was impossible to keep the law. Christ is the only one that kept the law. He said, and now you have a perfect law of liberty where you're, not, where, where you're not bound by that taskmaster. You have grace, and you want to go back to this. It doesn't make any sense. It's like when we have grace, we have to walk in the light. And we want to go back into the flesh. Picking up. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I, against things like these I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit later, love, that's my place, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. All right, so... Have you ever tried to quit a habit? Anybody here ever tried to quit a bad habit? Yes. All of us probably have. I knew somebody one time that decided they wanted to quit smoking. And when they did that, they tried to do it by just not smoking anymore. It didn't work. So then they started chewing gum. Double mint gum. If they didn't have that double mint gum... They might have a cigarette. Paul says, these are things that you should not be doing. But 
let me give you something to put in their place. All right, so anybody that's ever, any counselor that's ever had somebody, tried to help somebody, if you make a hole, you have to fill that hole with something or they're going to go back to it. Paul's really good about, these are the things you shouldn't do. Adulteries, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, fits of rage. But I got an idea. Let's try these things instead. So those are the fruits of the Spirit. He also says that those are diametrically opposed to one another. So if I'm in the bearing fruits of the Spirit, what can I not be doing? If I'm in the Spirit, where can I not be? I can't be in the flesh. All right, so if I'm in the Spirit, I'm not going to be in the flesh. Can you be in two places at one time? Yeah, me neither. If my parents could have been in two places at one time, I would have been a lot less problem, I can assure you. But you can't be in two places at one time. <laughs> and I would have been in a lot more trouble. Um, in the time that we've got left, I want to look at uh, four specific actions that I think will help us to stay in step with the Spirit like Paul tells us to do. And what we're going to do, I'm going to talk about each one of these, and then I'm going to ask you, which fruit of the Spirit do you think that's going to help us with? Okay? So specific actions to help us bear the fruit that we're told that we need to bear. First of all, let's talk about prayer. Prayer. Us talking to God. Um, all of us know how important conversation is. Husbands, wives, we know how important it is to stay in communication with one another, to talk. It's important in our relationship with God, too. Really important that we talk to him. James says in uh, James, in, uh, James 4, 2 and 3, he says, you have not because you ask not. So we have to talk to God. We, we need to let him know what the things that we need are. If, if it is something that is good for us, he'll give it to us. And you have to believe that. He is faithful and just. Okay? Uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16. So we know that if it's something that is good for us and we ask God for it, he's either going to give it to us or he's going to give us something better. All right, so it's important that we ask. It's, it's an opportunity to come before the throne. Folks, we didn't have that opportunity before. Before Christ, we, didn't, we couldn't approach God. We couldn't stand in front of God and, 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 and revere him. We couldn't stand in front of God at the throne and ask for the things that we need. I know I don't use it enough, but I want you to ask yourselves, do I use prayer enough? Five minutes? Well, we're not going to get done. <laughs> All right. Um, so what do you think? Which, which fruits of the Spirit do you think prayer is going to help us bear? Yeah, it's going to help us bear all of them. If you look down the list, it's pretty much going to help us with all of them. All right. Second thing, study. That's God talking to us so that it's not a one-sided conversation. We have to be willing to listen to what God's trying to say to us. Um. 1 Peter 3.15. Be ready at all times to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Well, if I'm not in the Word, how am I going to give that answer? All right? Hebrews 5.12. I 
Let's turn and read that one real quick. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. But we have to grow. When we're walking in the light, that has there has to be a maturing process. We have to be able to be stronger in the Word. He says, there's people that are uh, uh, have been a, and I don't know, he didn't give any time frame. But I can just see him saying, look, you've been a Christian for 10 years. You're not teaching? You're not capable of teaching? Walking in the light means that if we've been in the Word for 10 years and been in the church for 10 years, we should be able to teach others at that point. That's what walking in the light is. We're going to skip through here. All right, three, fellowship. How many, oh, by the way, how many of the how many of the fruits of the Spirit do you think that uh, studying being in the Word is going to help us bear? Yep, all of them. Fellowship. Acts 2.42. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and in breaking the bread and prayers. Um, together with like-minded people. Together with kindred spirits. I don't know about you, but when I was a, what I call a, a church pew Christian, it was hard to get up on Sunday morning. It's just hard to get up on Sunday morning. It was hard to come in here at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night. But when I started taking my faith more seriously, it's hard not to come here. It, when you've been in the, the, the dark world that we live in right now, and I don't want to be a, a, a pessimist, but it's a dark place. When you try to live when you try to walk the walk out there every day, there's no way I couldn't get up and come here on Sunday morning. Because I'm surrounded by people that believe the same thing I do, that are grateful for the same reasons I'm grateful, that are blessed for the same reasons that I'm blessed. That we, that we had a, a father that was good enough to send his son to die in my stead. I want to be here. And we should all want to be here. How many, think, how many of the fruits of the Spirit do you think that bears? Yeah, all of them. Um, you see a pattern? Love God and do good to all men. And I'm just going to keep going straight down the list. We're not going to skip to the end or anything because we'll we'll cover this another time. I'm sure I I'm, I'm sure I might get another opportunity to speak. Um, love and do good to all men. Galatians six eight through ten. If somebody gets there before me, read it, please. Yes, sir. What is that doing? I know this is a vague question. In my mind, when we were told to let our light shine, that's how he was, that's what he was talking about. I have a light. You have a light. If we don't leave here and let that light shine, we're just shining light for other people that already have a light. We need to take that light into the darkness. Okay? That's, that's who needs it. Now, we need it too. Don't get me wrong. We need it too. But they need it out there worse than we do. They need that light. That's where we're supposed to be shining our light. Before, I'm, I'm not going to quit until we cover this. What, are, what is our duty as a Christian? Okay? 
find the scripture here. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Real quick. Hmm? Yep. The Pharisees came up to him and he, they saw how he had quiet, how he had shut down the Sadducees. They thought, well, let's go poke him and let's go aggravate him like we do all the time. So they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And what did he say? Love the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. And he says, and then the second is like unto this, just like this, just as important as this, love your neighbor as yourself. So as a Christian, my responsibility is to love God, love man, and if I love God and love man, by natural progression, what is that going to make me want to do? Make disciples. So you can sum up our responsibility as a Christian in three things. Love God, love your fellow man, and make disciples. There are 613 laws in the Old Testament. God tells us, love me with all your heart and my son. Love your fellow man and go make disciples. And whatever you fall short on, if you're walking in the light, the blood of Christ will cover the rest of that. Great to be a Christian? We'll stop right there. I want to thank you very much.